This presentation is brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry. So this is the 10th commandment. You are not to have an illicit desire for your neighbor's possessions, positions, or persons. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Well, happy Sabbath, friends. Again, want to issue a special welcome to any visitors that we may have here today. And if you have been coming lately, or if you're one of our regular members, you'll know that we are in the midst of a series where we have been talking about those laws of love, the Ten Commandments, and they're also laws of liberty. But today we are dealing with the subject of the Tenth Commandment, and I've titled it A Greedy Heart. It's uh, the myth of more, you might say. We are bombarded in our day and age with materialism, hyper-materialism. It's not like we're just sniffing it, we're mainlining materialism. There is no time in the history of the world, never before has there been a culture that has had to ingest so much advertising that is designed the brightest and the best and the most powerful minds in the world on Madison Avenue invest billions of dollars, approximately five hundred billion dollars every year spent on marketing in North America encouraging you to be dissatisfied with what you have or the brand that you have or how much you have or who you have and the only thing happiness will come from getting more or something different. You're being told over and over and over again the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. A lot of us in our hearts are dissatisfied. Story of one such person in the Bible, you would think if you were king for a day you'd be happy. But sometimes even kings aren't happy. They don't have enough. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 21. And we read there about a king by the name of Ahab. 1 Kings chapter 21, you start with the first verse. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard that was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So adjacent to the palace Naboth, who was one of the citizens, he was a, probably had a large family, an older gentleman. He had a field where he had a nice vineyard. Vineyards were the prize. That was the best thing. If you had a good vineyard. And so Ahab's looking over his wall thinking, well, I might have a palace and I might have my own farms and vineyards, but I don't have that one. I'm just not going to be happy until I do have that one. And Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I might have it for a vegetable garden. What a shame to pluck up vines that take forever to grow and put turnips in. (laughs) Give me your vineyard, that I might have it for a vegetable garden, because it's near to my house. It'll be convenient. And for it, I'll give you a vineyard better than it, or if it seems good, I'll give you money. What do you want? I, I need to have it. But there's a problem. According to the Jewish law, you're not to sell your family's inheritance from your tribe to a different tribe. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbids that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Well, when, who does he think he is? And Ahab, Ahab went to his house, and he was sullen. He was depressed, that means, and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I'll not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed, and he turned away his face, and wouldn't eat any food. That's called a full-grown tantrum. <laughs> now, I know that just was peculiar with him, but no other adults do that when they can't get what they want. 
So Jezebel comes home. She's wondering, what's, why is your spirit so depressed? What's wrong with you? Well, I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said, give me your vineyard for money or else I'll trade you, and he won't give it to me. And she said to him, do you now exercise authority over Israel? Arise and eat food. Let your heart be cheerful. I'll get you the vineyard. He had a tantrum, and his little wife, he was going to help him get what he wanted. Well, what that meant was she proclaimed a feast and hired two false witnesses to say that Naboth was guilty of cursing the God, cursing God and cursing the government. You know, on both fronts, by the way, that's what they did with Jesus. They said that uh, he wasn't obeying the laws of God or the laws of Caesar. And then they immediately took him out before they could have much of a trial out of the city and they stoned Naboth. This innocent man doesn't know what's going on. That's kind of like the mafia. You don't give them what they want, they have ways of getting what they want. And Jezebel, that's how she operated. So now Naboth is finally going to be happy. Jezebel comes home and says, I've got good news. Go take possession. The vineyard is yours. You're going to get what you want. Now you'll be happy. So Ahab doesn't want to ask any questions about how she worked that out. He suspects that there was foul play, but as long as he gets what he wants. So while he's walking around and surveying Naboth's vineyard and thinking, I'll cut that down here and I'll put the vegetables here and I'll have the fountain over, guess who shows up and spoils his party? His old nemesis, Elijah the prophet. And Elijah came down, he said, as uh, soon as Nah A Ahab sees him, he says, oh, have you found me, my enemy? said, I'm your enemy because you sold yourself to work wickedness and you killed an innocent man and took his vineyard. And he said, now because you've done this, well, let me read it to you out of the Bible. Behold, I'll bring calamity on you. I'll take away your posterity and cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. And I'll make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. They were wiped out. They were totally eliminated because of the provocation wherewith you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And it says, there is no one like Ahab, verse 25, who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. Verse 27, so when Ahab heard those words of Elijah, he tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth on his body. He fasted, he lay in sackcloth, and he went about mourning. Notice, chapter begins by him thinking, I'll never be happy unless I get Naboth's vineyard. He was coveting his other man's, another man's field. And when he found out he couldn't have it, he thought, I'm going to take it by hook or crook. I've got to have it. When he finally got it, now he's happy. Is he happy? No. Now he's more unhappy. He tears his clothes and goes about mourning. When you covet what you should not covet, should you ever get it, the Lord will not bless and you will not have happiness. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. Psalms 119, verse 36 and 37, Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. We may not throw ourselves on the ground and have a tantrum, but in our own ways, many have greedy hearts and we're not satisfied. Now, the Tenth Commandment, I'm assuming that you know what the Tenth Commandment is, but let me read it to you. And you'll find it not only in Exodus 20, verse 17, you'll find it again in Deuteronomy 5, verse 21, and in various and sundry places in the New Testament and other parts of the Bible. And we read Exodus 20, 17, these words that God spoke. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So this is the 10th commandment. Do not covet anything that you're not supposed to be desiring. It is probably the most unique of the 10 commandments, and I say that for several reasons. First of all, most of the commandments have to do with outward behavior or conduct. The last commandment points back to the source of all sin. It's something on the inside. It's something going on here. You can be covetous 
you can be just a rank, covetous person and outwardly you can look like the finest Christian. Jesus talked about people who prayed long prayers and they went to church but they devoured widows' houses. They were covetous. But they were very religious because it's looking on the desires of the heart. It'll eventually play out in the life. Exodus 18.21 When they were to pick judges, moreover you shall select from all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness and make them rulers. That was the criteria that they were to hate covetousness. That greed for what others have, if they've got that in their hearts, they'll be very susceptible to bribes and twisting judgment. Now as we define covetousness, uh, I want to make it clear that it is not wrong to desire something or someone. You would be homeless and single right now, all of you, if you didn't at some point desire or covet something or someone. It is not wrong to want a house, it is not wrong to want a field, it is not wrong to want an ox or a donkey or a car or a spouse. Matter of fact, it is right to want those things. God placed those desires in your heart. The Bible even tells us there's some things we are commanded to covet. So it's not that coveting is wrong. Sometimes you take half a commandment and you get things all mixed up. The commandment says, Do not make an, unto thee the likeness of anything in the heaven above or the earth beneath or the water under the earth. And people stop right there. They say, Don't have a photograph. It's a likeness of something. Don't have a painting of flowers on your wall. It's a likeness of something. Don't have, and people have no art. They have no photographs of their kids because it's idolatry. They don't read the rest of the commandment that says, And bow down to them. Right? Same thing with the covet commandment. It doesn't just say don't covet anything. It says don't covet things that you have no right to desire. See what I'm saying? So what is covetousness? Oh by the way I was going to give you a verse. 1 Corinthians 12 31. What can you covet? He says covet earnestly. We're commanded to covet earnestly the best gifts. And I show you a most excellent way. If you're going to covet something, the best thing to covet to long after to crave is the spiritual gifts, the best gifts. The gift of love is what he mentions. What is covetousness? It is a forbidden desire, an envious eagerness to possess what is not lawfully obtainable, excessive and culpably desirous of the possessions of another, inappropriate or inordinate desire for the possessions, positions, or persons that belong to someone else. Sometimes we covet a person's position. Sometimes we're covetous by comparison. Colossians 3, 5, Wherefore put to death your members which are on earth, and he's talking about these fleshly selfish desires, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Have you ever thought that the covetousness is idolatry? You'd never bow down to an idol, but some of us bow to the idols of fashion. Someone said, I think it was a pastor, Haddon R. W. Robinson, covetousness is simply craving more of what you already have enough of. Covetousness is simply craving more of what you already have enough of. But we're not happy. I'm not done with my verse in Colossians 3. Covetousness, which is idolatry, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. It's, it represents a, an unconverted heart when we're constantly dissatisfied. It's not only covetous.